going to read from a couple of poems from this book, The National Happiness, with the creepy, broken-down doll cover. Um, and I'll explain very briefly why why there's a creepy, broken-down doll on the cover of this book. Um, I um, I was raised by a miniaturist. My mother was a miniaturist, so she made dollhouse furniture and toys and um, built dollhouses. And the house I grew up in had a dollhouse in every room of the house. So that was the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, the bathroom, the laundry room, the garage. Every single room in the house had a dollhouse. And um, I grew up in that sort of very strange environment. And I really hate dolls, <laughs> as, a result, as you can imagine. So um, I write a lot about toys and dolls. And so I'll um, read a couple of doll poems. And I'll start. Uh, just in the interest of happiness, or the lack thereof, I'll read a, a poem, a thematic, thematically appropriate poem, um, called A Brief History of Happiness. In the beginning, there was nothing, or rather, nowhere else to start. There was a girl buried in the dark silt of her own heart, ribs picketed like a fence. There was the private circumference of the yard, a tree with its poisoned crown of leaving. She kept returning to climb it. Its fragrance was undeniable, the dangerous consequence of every day lived in this way. It's just a muscle, she'd say, nothing compared to walls or to words. There wasn't a prince, but there was a moon, new, full, or quartered, a house with many storied windows, incomplete encircling, not knowing when to return or what to return to. <clears throat> Even nothing was some place to start. Some machines, like memory, rewind. Others move forward with mad knowledge, uncontrollable want. There is no other kind. Um, I'm not the only person obsessed with dolls. Is there anybody in this room obsessed with dolls? Uh -huh. Think about them. Okay. Just in there. And Keith, because he's forced to buy me doll, doll parts for birthdays and Christmas and things. Um, so one of the, one of the people uh, who is obsessed with dolls, historical figure, is Thomas Edison, um, who actually, it's an interesting story. He uh, was interested in kind of inventing motion pictures. He was on the, hot on the trail of inventing motion pictures, and he got derailed because he, uh, simultaneously he decided he wanted to manufacture a talking doll and um, like mass produce these things and distribute them all over the country. Uh, but the technology was really young. Uh, he had sort of invented this phonograph technology that he could put inside the dolls, and when they became mass produced, they would break easily and they were very, very heavy, so it's not practical to give like a small child a four or eight pound doll to carry around. And they break and you can't take them anywhere to have them fixed. And so this was like a huge failure for him. And meanwhile, while he was inventing this mass produced doll, the French figured out film technology and um, made motion pictures happen. So um, it's one of his big failures and I'm interested in the idea of Edison failing at anything. Um, and his, his own obsession with dolls. This is a poem about that, and it's called Edison in Love. Thomas Edison loved a doll with a tiny phonograph inside because he made her speak. Is there any other reason to love a woman? <laughs> Did she say the ghost of my conception or something equally demure? It's hard to be sure how he feels when he holds me, I fall apart. I'm projecting here. He didn't feel her first transgression was in having no, obs no obsession. Rene Descartes, too, traveled alone with a doll in a box he called his daughter. Francine, Francine, is it better to be silent and wait for everything we were promised? Or should we love them back the way a train loves its destination, as if we have the machinery necessary for it? Mm -hmm. 
I'm particularly um, interested in Edison, obviously. And there's another uh, another sort of Edison incident when he eventually did get to film. Um, he made a lot of, sort of early films, which were actually called actualities, uh, films of people walking down the street, or uh, films of um, women standing over uh, vent vented grates in sidewalks and cities, and the air would blow up, and like the men in the 1890s would stand around the corner just to watch this happen. <laughs> and uh, it's very strange. But in any case, uh, he he was very involved in, in early film, and one of the films. Um, that he made, which you can see on the YouTube, if you go and look it up, um, is this film called The Dixon Experimental Film. And uh, it was the first sort of marriage of sound and image. So they were trying to make sound happen uh, very early on. And this was in 1894. And um, they, they sort of failed at it. They, they couldn't really sync up the sound and the movement to make it work. But in this one particular film, it's very interesting because um, there are two men dancing in the middle of this stage while another man, who actually is the director of the film, um, Dixon, uh, who's playing a violin. And these two men are dancing on screen. And it's really erotic, actually, <laughs> to watch these men dancing in 1894. They're holding each other very close. And it's, very, it's actually very beautiful and interesting. But it became quite controversial. And it was originally called Two Men Dancing. And they changed the title of the film to give it a more clinical name so that it wouldn't sort of sound homoerotic. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I, I was interested in this. And um, the poem is called Contemplating Quiet. To contemplate quiet, start with the first marriage of sound and image. 17 seconds of film in which two men are dancing to the wheedling strains of a violin. One steadies the other and turns him toward the light. They hold each other's waists, struggling against the convention of their weight. The violinist scrapes out a barker roll, a song a gondolier devised, to stroke the riverbed, mosquito-thin melody about the joyful, lonely life of men at sea. No woman's in sight or earshot her voice, recorded in smoke, lies still at the bottom of a drawer, transparent and tough as a beetle's wing broken off in flight. This is memory, then, nothing to imagine beyond the frame, one man's song buzzing the air again and again like bees bearding the hive of a wall, as if to prove its existence unaltered by the loop of history. What synchronized mystery accompanies them to hold us so tightly in their grasp? Did they suffer in silence or because of it? Underfoot, the persistent itch of sand in a shoe, the circumstance of who's leading whom, the unspoken conversation one whispers into the other's ear that we'll never hear the taciturning circle that suffices when a word will not. Wedded to wax, quiets extinct as the horn that throws its contrail shadow to the sunstruck floor, extinct as the phonograph's flat scratched cylinder whose cone pulled discord out of rhyme. In the space between notes, the absence of women is easily accounted for but even an echo leaves room for sound. To contemplate quiet, shut your mouth as they did until nothing comes out.